right. I'll call the meeting to order. Good afternoon to each of you. Uh, if you haven't signed in on the guest or the attendance sheet, please do so before you leave. And as is our custom, uh, we'll have the guests who are here today introduce themselves. So. Hi, I'm Sarah Turner with Campus Sustainability. I'm Iron Stemmer, the Coalition of Human Sciences and Education. Yes. Yeah. That's the Russian We have some more guests. You do not remember the Senate, your guest. I'm not going to stand for some reason, but. <laughs> I'm a retired geologist from the Museum of Natural Science, and I'm on the library committee, which has a resolution before you. I'm Cameron Barney, I'm a graduate student in social work. And I'm Rachel Banning, I'm a graduate student in social work. We'll have to get after your instructor for not being here today. Yes. <laughs> Any more guests? Mallory Daisy, academic affairs. Okay. We're really good to have you, Mallory, even though the first team's not here. We're, we're glad that you're here. Um, I neglected to read the proxies and alternates for today's meeting, so I'll do that. We have Nathan Lord for Kristen Healy, Stuart Irvine for Brian McCann, Costas Bush for Baba Sarker, and Ali Ali, and Fred Agazade, Matt Van. Uh, Vangel for Gregory Souls, Sophie Warner for Brooks Elwood, Nan Walker for Tracy Court, Jose Torres for Kwame Aguiman, Mandy Lopez for Kevin Cope, Kristen Stair for Carl Monsenbacher, Suresh Rai for Doreen Boulder, Rachel Stevens for Catherine Henniger, and Jill Monroe for Jeff Brooks. Are there any other alternates or proxies? Wait, wait. Uh, yes, we have um, Dr. Del Piero for Juan Martinez and was there one under? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Cassandra Cheney for Sonia Wildcat. All right. Gel for Kyla. Okay. Any others? Yes. Move the dog bears up a lower rate. Right. Okay. So please make sure you're all signed in on the proxy sheet. <laughs> yes. That would be much appreciated if you sign in on the proxy sheet. Um, to sign up for public comment. The next item on the agenda is consideration of our uh, February 18th minutes. And as is their custom, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes with any uh, minor corrections or additions or deletions to be made later. Do I have a motion? Randy Duran, second. Okay. Uh, Cassandra? Any items to be added or deleted? Hearing no discussion or changes then, all in favor of accepting the minutes with any minor changes to be made later, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. <coughs> um, go right to the president's report and I'll try to keep it as brief as possible since we do have lots of business to conduct today. Uh, I am serving on the Associate Vice President for Human Resource Management Search and in that regard we've narrowed the list to four candidates that we will bring to campus. We're trying to do that in the next two weeks because 
knowing that spring break is coming up, and then after that, it's dead week, and then after that, lots of you will be gone. We're trying to speed that up because we know that's maybe one of the two most important searches that are ongoing right now. We also have an interim vice president for economic development and research search, and I neglected to put on that we, we have a uh, search ongoing for vice president for student affairs. So both of those search committees have ample uh, faculty representation on. I did have an opportunity to meet with our uh, interim vice president for economic development and research, and he appears to have a pretty good handle on what we need to do in that regard in the interim time period until we actually have the vice president. And so he is uh, moving forward with some changes that probably will make us even more competitive in the, in the next few months. Uh, I had occasion to meet with other uh, statewide faculty members with the Board of Regents Commissioner uh, Hunter Reed and her deputy for strategic communications. Meg Casper Sundstrom on attainment of the master plan goal. And what the Board of Regents appears to be doing is moving away from this command and control to more of a promotion and how do we assist the universities and colleges in the state. It was kind of a shift in the way that they conducted their uh, activities in the past. So that's a breath of fresh air, if I can use that trite phrase. And so they appear to be much more receptive to proposals from institutions like LSU on how we can actually improve the educational delivery process to our students, as well as improve the access. I've met with uh, Executive Vice President and Provost Haney, not only with the Executive Committee, but we have a weekly meeting. And so in that regard, uh, the Provost's office is opened up even more than it has been in the past as far as faculty input. And so, uh, obviously we have good relationships with Vice Provost Lee and Vice Provost Cassidy, but again, we're, we're moving forward as a faculty with being involved in a lot of the decisions that we didn't uh, have a part in in the past. Uh, the Board of Supervisors meeting was this morning, and they did approve the Center for Analytics and Research and Transportation Safety. That is a new name, but the same old uh, people and the same old transportation studies that have been done in that building on, on uh, the south side of campus. They did approve a, approve a letter of intent for us to establish a VFA in film and TV, and that will expand our media offerings uh, in, in that area. They also approved changing the name of Public Administration Institute be, to become more modernized. Uh, I didn't pay enough attention to know what that new name is, so I apologize for that. And then last but not least, the staff Senate representatives also give a report along with me as being faculty Senate president and also chair of the Council of Faculty Advisors. And they pointed out that the resolution that we uh, passed 18-02 at the end of 2018 in support of developing university protocol in the event of the death of an LSU employee. <coughs> we sponsored that and passed it based upon the staff senate taking the lead. And in that regard, nothing has been done at the university level. And so that was pointed out and apologies were made by president and the board chair that yes that is an important thing to do so we will see that move forward uh, in the near future I hope. Faculty Senate elections uh, will be next month. We will and I'm assembling the nominating committee now. Some of you have been asked to serve. Uh, the bylaws indicate that we have retiring faculty senators uh, to do that and they have to be from four different colleges so uh, I've had one acceptance, one decline, and two that are still uncertain. So I'll be doing getting back after that tonight and tomorrow so that you'll know who the nominating committee is. We will be electing president, vice president, secretary, and two members at large to serve faculty senate office and executive committee next year. Uh, just for your information, 
this will be my last term. I'm not going to try for, to beat Kevin's decade record. One, I don't want to be here at LSU quite that much longer. But secondly, I've got some other things that I'd like to do uh, with my professional career in the next couple of years. And, and hurting you all just doesn't fit into those plans. So that means that it will be a wide open nomination. And I've already uh, given the nominating uh, committee that I requested to serve instructions that technically they can ask anybody they want as long as they're a full-time faculty. Obviously, if they don't have some faculty governance experience, they're going to be limited in how they can actually uh, guide faculty center. We will be also be electing members to the Budget and Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, as far as I know, Dr. Baumgartner has not closed the list on that, so if you'd like to serve on that, contact her. Same for Committee on Committees, which actually does develop the list of committees. Uh, our organization is slightly different than others, that we have a Committee on Committees that actually fills committee vacancies. Uh, I recommend, or I can fill in vacancies during the middle of the year, but realistically those committees are filled by your representatives on the Committee on Committees. Uh, we will also begin the elections for your college representatives for the Faculty Senate, and so I've just outlined here uh, some of the colleges are small enough. Our representation is 25 members for each faculty senate representative. And so when you divide out those, then because agriculture had a couple of new faculty hires uh, this past year and into January, then they actually gained a seat, as did engineering and human sciences and education. Unfortunately, for the science representatives, you lost a couple of faculty members, and as of the date to tally was taken, had not replaced those, so you'll be down a senator, uh, down from 11 to 10. That's the way that everything operates. So overall, because we'll have 1,732 faculty council members, uh, as of the census that was taken last month, then we'll actually have two more senators next year than we do this year. So. I will be sending out that information to the policy committees and the colleges that have policy committees. Some other uh, colleges actually have a representation scheme. Uh, when it comes to mind is music and dramatic arts because they have a small number of units within uh, that college, then they have a apportionment system that they use. So I'll be getting that so that uh, as soon as April 1st rolls around, it won't be an April Fool, but it will be an opportunity then for the colleges to uh, get their process started. Hopefully most of those will be ended by our April 23rd meeting. Tomorrow I'll be <coughs> representing uh, LSU, the system-wide approach at the Conference of Louisiana Colleges and Universities. There will be a faculty panel on various issues. And some of the issues we hope to bring about are continuing deficiencies in, in budgets, the need for us to continue to expand our in, information technology resources, and to ask for faculty representation on governing boards, like the Board of Supervisors, Board of Regents, whatever. Because without a voice sitting there, we, we are at a disadvantage compared with the students who do have members on both of those uh, governing bodies. I want to remind you that the capital campaign kickoff is March 28th and 29th. For those of you who are alumni of LSU have been inundated, I think, with this is information, etc. I would urge you, when contacted, to consider making a small donation or donation, however, in amount, but at least to make a donation so that you can keep track of everything that the foundation is doing in support of LSU. Otherwise, you won't be in the information line to hear all of the things that the foundation staff and the deans and the department heads are actually doing to raise funds to support us. So my, my appeal is 
that if we don't show that we're interested enough in our own future, then how can we convince donors to invest in, quote, our future as well as those of the students? But you, you can make your own decision about your own charitable uh, contributions. Again, most of us receive so many requests for donations that you can't possibly address all of those or give them the amount of money they want. But I'm just saying, if we take an interest in this campaign, participate whenever possible, then that will show that, yes, we are indeed interested in the future of our institution. Uh, last but not least, and uh, Julia can talk in more detail, she's passed out some flyers on the LSU uh, Faculty Club Incorporated and the Faculty Club Building 80th Anniversary. They're going to be celebrating on that Friday night on the 29th. Uh, Julia, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I would like to um, pass out flyers to those who didn't get them. And um, this is this is our one of our biggest events. Um, normally, it's held in the in the fall, but we moved it to the spring in conjunction with the 80th anniversary of the building. So, um, love to have you come out there. You. Uh, as uh, Dr. McMillan has talked about the charitable donations, it is a fundraising event, but you do not have to donate. Come out and party with us anyway. Um, there will be a lot of good food and um, things like that. Prizes, there will be door prizes, so um, come on out. It's on the 29th. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes my presence report. Are there any questions? From me about anything that I talked about or should be doing. Then we'll move on to the next item. Uh, we knew that we had lots of business and uh, Dr. Warner decided that he could come on April 23rd uh, to talk about the strategic initiatives and so today we're privileged to have Sarah Temple from Campus Sustainability uh, to talk about recycling and sustainability. And at some time, probably next fall, then she will give us even more details uh, about some of those opportunities. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really here to try to recruit, recruit y'all, hopefully to. Come to an event we're having and then also to hopefully maybe volunteer for Spring Greeting Day. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, we're having an, our inaugural Zero Waste Event Planning Seminar on April 5th, so Friday, April 5th. Um, this is the first thing like this that has ever been at LSU. We are trying to get LSU to be a zero waste university. Um, we're now able to compost pre-consumer food waste, so clean kitchen waste, and post-consumer food waste. We have partnered with LSU Entomology to take food waste from the dining hall, and they are using a process with black soldier fly that is actually the black soldier fly are <coughs> composting or consuming the food. We are then taking that compost and giving it to the LSU Landscape Services Department to use on the grounds here at LSU. So it's a closed loop sustainable system. We want to feature that system here at this event on April 5th. And we're inviting one or two members from any campus organization or group. So faculty senate can sit one or two people, be wonderful. We're going to have, it's going to be farm to table. So we're going to have um, just little snacks from the Hill Farm that students grew there. And we're going to talk about how organizations can have events that are zero waste and how we can help out with that financially. So it's the first of its kind. We are kind of going to have to cap it off at about 100 people. So if you're interested, please, um, Dr. Willens, I'm going to send him a link so that y'all can easily RSVP and sign up. But all you have to do is email sustainability at lsu.edu to RSVP if you're interested. So we're excited about that because we haven't done this before. It's going to be at the faculty club. Um, so yeah, that's. And then the next thing is Spring Greeting Day. I don't know if I can be blown up a little bit, but so every year we have Spring Greeting Day. It's an annual half-day service project to beautify and green the LSU campus. 
Basically, we, we plant plants and trees around campus. We rely on volunteers, mostly students, some staff and faculty, um, to come out between 10.30 and 2, plant plants all around campus. We have designated areas that we've kind of chosen ahead of time to, to do planting. But anyone that volunteers gets a free t-shirt and lunch. And it's really fun. We just, it's laid back. We have a, we have a KLSU plays music and, you know, we have food. And so it, it's a good time to come out with your, some of your students that might want to volunteer and spend time with them. Um, and there's also an opportunity for any campus organization that sends 10 or more people um, to receive a $250 stipend. And that's just one of our incentives to try to get people to come volunteer. Last year we had 268 volunteers, which was a record for us for spring breeding day. And we planted over 18,000 plants and trees. So it was quite a bit. It's really fun and you know, we'd love to have some members of the faculty come out and, and support us as a volunteer. The main thing is just that you have to sign up in advance with the link that I'm gonna send to the email. Um, so that's that. Um, and I just wanted to let y'all know in, in February we started composting off food waste. I've talked a little bit about that already. Um, but for a year now, we've been sending all pre-consumer food waste to local farms to use the animal feed. And last year we had more than 75 tons of food waste suffering from the landfill with, with that process. And we anticipate with this new black soldier fly process, we will have 100 tons per year or more of food waste from LSU diverted from the landfill, which is a huge amount. So I'm just really excited because I've been trying for four years to get to get to find a solution for composting food. Um, and we finally kind of have one, so we're, we're excited about that. But as he said, you know, in the fall, I'm going to hope to come back and do a more um, formal sort of thorough update on campus sustainability, if y'all want to have me. But please come volunteer. Come to our event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Sarah? Just as an added piece of information, black soldier fly larvae and them using food waste, some scientists are studying using it as a food source because use of insects is catching on as far as helping to supplement our dwindling other protein plant and animal supplies. So it's not gonna go away very quickly as long as they're as efficient as they are in converting. And we're giving a um, we're giving a presentation in September to the People Museum beautiful annual statewide conference on this project on the Black Soldier Fly. Again, you are attending that conference. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah. Um, we'll now move to old business, and so we've got two different uh, resolutions that we have the second reading on. We passed. The first reading at our uh, meeting in February, and so I'll read Establishment of Student Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, Faculty Senate Resolution 19-02. Uh, and I'll remind you that this is at the request of the LSU Student Senate, whereas a student enrolled at LSU should be aware of rights granted and upheld by the administration <coughs> and the responsibilities necessary to receive these rights and where students of the university are protected by established policies, which are numerous and not always easily accept, accessed. Whereas there is no central document that informs students or faculty members of these rights and responsibilities, and whereas a central document will emphasize and clarify such rights and responsibilities that a student at the university may have, and of which faculty members should be aware, and whereas violations of these student rights may be addressed by filing a complaint to the student government judicial branch, and whereas the judicial branch may offer an endorsement of the validity of the student complaint through judicial opinion, and whereas the proposed list of student rights and responsibilities is not exhaustive and based upon existing policies and practice, including code student conduct, faculty handbook, PS22 student absence from class, PS29 management of courses and classes, PS30 student privacy rights, PS44 student grading, PS45 courses and curriculum, PS48 general appeal procedure available to students, the LSU general catalog, LSU schedule booklet, and the faculty education rights and privacy act of 1974, 
Therefore, be it resolved that the LSU Faculty Senate affirms the student Senate request that the LSU Student Bill of Rights and Responsibilities will be one, students have the responsibility to know and follow the student code of conduct. Two, students have the right to meet with professors or instructors concerning their classes. Three, students have the responsibility to attend class and to seek out work for which they have missed in the case of an excused absence. Four, students have the right to make up coursework for absences deemed excusable by PS22 student absence from class or an individual professor. Number five, students are responsible for providing reasonable advance notice and appropriate documentation to be excused from class or an assignment. Six, students have the right to access the syllabi in their courses and to any changes that are made during the semester in accordance with PS 29, management of courses and classes. Number seven, students have the right to view updated grade information during the semester. Number eight, students have the responsibility to make appeals of final grades within 30 days after the beginning of the regular semester. Number nine, students have the right to reschedule a final examination if there are three final exams, examination scheduled within a 24 hour period for the final examination schedule for each semester. Number 10, students have the responsibility to request to the dean of their college that their exams be rescheduled when this occurs per the final examination schedule for each semester. 11, students have the right to express their opinions within the context of the course and the course material and to be graded on mastery of course material and not on personal philosophy or other personal characteristics. 12, students have the right to appeal the decisions of their professors in accordance with PS 48, general appeal procedure available to students. 13, students have the right to confidentiality of their records in accordance with university FERPA privacy guidelines. 14, students have the right to access free on-campus resources when available and appropriate for an assignment. And 15, students have the right to be considered stakeholders in the university policies that affect their abilities to achieve academic and personal success on campus. And then the listing of those different policies and practices will be included at the end of the Student Bill of Rights and Responsibilities so that, again, they've got access to those, knowing that not everything in the policy is going to be included in these bills of student rights and responsibilities. So, since we've already had the first reading, now we'll entertain any discussion on this resolution. Yes? I have a question on the document that we received. The original number eight on the list was deleted. Then it reappears as current number 12. Yes, your question is? What's up with that? Wait, what is up with that? Yeah, there's a statement that's deleted and also... Well, we moved it. We moved it. We changed the order of it. So it's still in there. It's just number 12 now instead of eight. Yes, Andrew? What's all the blue underlining? Meet with professors for instructors and take classes at the lectures? The underlining is the links where they can actually, because most of them use their phones now, or iPads or other tablets to get, these are the links that actually go to the policies. So the take class links to PS22? Yes. Yes. I appreciate you bringing up that point. And point number three, I think there's a grammatical mistake. I think the word for shouldn't be there. Wait, say what? I think the word for should not be there. F-O-R. Work for which they have missed. I think it's work for which they have missed. That's the way the actual policy PS22 says. Okay, then the mistake is there. You can correct it here. I would agree that it's probably not the best grammar. Well, it's incorrect grammar. Yes. It's worse than that. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Any other discussion or comments? Yes, Lily. I'm just curious. Remind me, is this assuming that there wasn't a Bill of Rights prior to this? Correct. This is the first Bill of Rights we've had for students? That is correct. Isn't that weird? Well, if you recall, two student government presidents ago, then this passed their student government, and then they didn't do anything about it. 
So this is a resurrection. We passed a resolution. Uh, I take that back. We discussed it, and we're waiting on them to take further action after they pass their student government uh, motion, and nothing ever happened. So this was a resurrection by the current student government. Well, that's good. Okay. Thank you. So that's what this is. Any other? Yes. With number 10, I think, uh, the, the way that it reads, I'm just thinking that they go directly to the dean of their college for her family scheduling. Shouldn't they have some kind of aspect of if they aren't uh, specific that's, arrangements? That's directly out of the examination schedule that's been in effect for at least a decade. Okay. And, and quite honestly, most of the wording here comes either out of the policy or out of the general catalog or out of the schedule book. So if a faculty has a, has a student, has a student that comes to them and says, I have to be out the exam in 24 hours. No, they have to, they have to, that's why this is in here in they particular. Have the they have to go to their dean and make the request. And then the dean tells the instructor, yes, I have given permission. Well, well let me phrase that. Does the student select the exam when she wants to be examined in the 24 yes. hours? Or the dean says, yes, you can take whatever, this course exam outside the, you know, the regular. Or the student requests the student, which they want. The student requests, the dean decides. The way the policy is written. <laughs> so, Dora, if you want to change the policies, there's a mechanism by which we can change I don't the policy. Want to I'm just saying that I can send it to the dean. Yes. <laughs> uh, the reason that is in there specifically is most of us have had students that come in at the very last minute and say, oh, I've got three exams next week yep. on, on the day that your schedule, can I change mine? No, clearly says they have to request three weeks in advance of their dean. Okay, so that's the safeguard time frame that gets us off the hook, so to speak. It doesn't, it's not in the field right, it's in the actual exam policy. Anything else? All right, then I'll call for the vote. All in favor of passing this resolution, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. The next uh, second reading is on establishment of a legal defense fund, and Andrew will read that on behalf of the Benefits Advisory Committee. Thank you, Ken. <coughs> So based on the comments last time, the main changes are those first two whereas clauses. Yes. <coughs> on this, in red, are the additions, and then in blue is the link to that particular item. And then there's a strikeout on the very end. What about black versus gray? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember what I sent in. But, uh, I don't, I'm sure there was no red, gray, black, or blue. Or <laughs> so they would know that they're there. Um, all right, well, let me just read it again. Here's what you said. Here's what you said. Uh, establishment of a legal defense fund sponsored by the Benefits Advisory Committee. <clears throat> Whereas legal defense funds have long served to defend the rights and advance the interests of diverse persons professional and public interest groups, such as the Legal Defense and Educational Fund of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and the American Association of University Professors Legal Defense Fund. Whereas such legal defense funds pay expenses involved in lawsuits when such groups are forced into justifiable litigation, whether as plaintiffs or as defendants, to defend their right rights or advance their interests. Whereas beginning in at least 2010, employer contributions to LSU's ORP, the Optional Retirement Plan, 
failed to meet the legally required minimum, and university faculty members have been forced to sue the teachers' retirement system of Louisiana, the LSU Board of Supervisors for relief, and that's just a link to, um, <coughs> I believe that's the initial uh, suit. Okay, Whereas, yes, uh, yeah. Whereas the plaintiffs, uh, Professors Kevin Cope and Roger Lane, have since 2010 uh, paid the costs of that litigation of personal funds and individual contributions. Whereas that litigation, which eventually was, which might eventually result in substantial relief for the plaintiffs and all other participants in the ORP, with estimates ranging up to over $100 million. Whereas the lawsuit is proceeding slowly will certainly incur further costs before resulting in a judgment, whereas that lawsuit is only one of several issues that involve conflict between LSU's faculty and its management. Other examples including violations of academic freedom and due process for which LSU has since 2012 been under censure by the AAUP, whereas the foregoing conflicts are longstanding and persistent with no indication for management of interest in working toward a resolution so that any reasonable person would expect them to continue for the foreseeable future. Whereas the continued underfunding of higher education by the Louisiana state government has persisted for more than a decade, so that any reasonable person would expect additional conflicts to arise to acknowledge these management of faculty related to low salaries, poor benefits, scarce revenue, resources, and a deteriorating physical plan. Whereas the faculty's ability to seek legal recourse could encourage management to seek solutions to such existing and potential conflicts through more robust and comprehensive shared governance than the university of the university that currently pertains. Whereas the that great is the great. Whereas the major impediment to the faculty engaging in justifiable litigation remains the scarcity of funding to retain lawyers, whereas the faculty might be able to secure funding for the purpose of such litigation through individual donations, as have already been used to support the ORP lawsuit, whereas the faculty might be able to secure additional funding from foundations, professional associations, private benefactors, from traffic organizations, public appeals, and other sources, whereas standing as a not-for-profit corporation is necessary in order to issue tax receipts for such donations, and otherwise solicit, manage, and spend funds in a transparent and appropriate manner. Whereas the faculty of other post-secondary institutions as diverse as Kent State University, the Avro Valley College, Windsor University, Southern University, and the University of Washington have at various times created legal defense funds to defend faculty rights and advance faculty interests. Therefore, be it resolved that an ad hoc committee of this body made up of members with relevant expertise be timely formed to investigate the possibility of establishing a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, tentatively named the University Faculty Legal Defense Fund of Louisiana, associated bank accounts, crowdfunding campaigns on GoFundMe, or similar services, and or anything else necessary to the legal defense fund, period. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This is the second reading, so we've already entered it into our item of business. Uh, I want to make a couple comments in my uh, talk about faculty activities to the Board of Supervisors this morning. I did mention each of these resolutions, all five of them, and the reason for them. Uh, and we did not get any uh, feedback on any of them except the last one. And I'll we'll obviously talk about uh, resolution 19-06 when we get to that. So essentially, they understand the purpose of this. The reason that is going to be independent of the university, per se, is that it really needs to be at arm's length away from the university and the activities. And the reason it's not going to be assigned directly to the Benefits Advisory Committee is for two reasons. One, we do want to show that it is separate, even though we'll have faculty members on uh, the Legal Defense Fund in various capacities. We don't want then it to be a function of a university body like the Faculty Senate, and also then that allows then some independent uh, evaluations of proposals that come in, cases that arise, etc. And also then lastly, the Benefits Advisory Committee 
by the time you consider all the other things that we want in terms of benefits, they're going to be way too busy just to handle this by themselves also. So some of the benefits committee may serve and on, on this legal defense fund, uh, getting it initiated, et cetera, but it will technically be separated from us. Yeah, we need a separate board of directors. Yes, of course. absolutely. Yeah. So, discussion. Floor is open for discussion. No questions. All right, then we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of uh, resolution 19 03, establishment of the legal defense fund, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Any abstentions? Then expect that we will send out a solicitation from Andrew for those of you who would like to serve so that we at least get this initiated. And that's probably the best way for us to handle it. Uh, if we had a general faculty list, then we would send out to every faculty member because the university doesn't quite have that in place yet then please tell your colleagues that they can also contact Andrew, and Andrew will be the immediate uh, contact person, may or may not be that individual in the future. Okay? We're square, right, Andrew? Yes. Okay. We'll be contacting the accounts and the lawyers. Now for new business. Um, We've got three uh, new resolutions, and the first is reviving the resolution that we passed at least three or four different times. <coughs> and now our interim uh, dean of the graduate school, our interim associate dean of the graduate school, and our executive vice president provost have all said, yeah, maybe it's time that we do this. So. The resolution is very timely, and uh, so I'll go ahead and read the resolution, uh, and then we'll vote on whether we're actually going to uh, accept it in to uh, deliberation. Resolution 19-04, election of graduate council membership, whereas the LSU Board of Supervisors regulations, Article 1, Section 2.B.2, duties, authorizes the faculty or faculty council to establish curricula, fix standards of instruction, determine requirements for degrees, and generally determine educational policy subject to the authority of the board, and whereas the faculty senate possesses all of the powers conferred upon the faculty council by regulation to the board of supervisors or otherwise, and shall exercise such powers in a manner consistent with the policies of the faculty council and Whereas faculty senate standing committees, including admission standards and honors, budget planning and advisory, courses and curricula, general education, and library have shared governance with Office of Academic Affairs. And whereas faculty senate resolution 10-03, replacing the current system of appointments with a new system of elections for members of the graduate council, noted that appointment of graduate council members is incompatible with principles of shared governance and recommended election of graduate council members. And it was adopted on March 15, 2010. And whereas faculty senate resolution 11-17 election for members of the LSU graduate council, restated the need for election of graduate council members to advise the graduate dean and was adopted on November 3rd, 2011. And whereas the graduate school and graduate dean have implemented requirements that do not necessarily further graduate education as indicated in faculty senate resolution 12-1, graduate faculty status, confidence in colleagues and their credentials on annual certification of graduate faculty status of each faculty member, and whereas recent deans and interim deans of the graduate school have indicated agreement with the election of graduate council members to be advisory to the dean, but have not taken any actions to implement this change, and whereas recent changes in graduate school policies were not voted upon by the graduate faculty, which is not aligned with shared governance principles, therefore be it resolved that the LSU Faculty Senate authorizes the Faculty Senate Executive Committee to immediately conduct elections from among the full graduate 
faculty members in the colleges of Coast and Environment, Engineering, Human Sciences and Education, and Humanities and Social Sciences to fill the vacancies in the Graduate Council that will occur this year, and therefore be it further resolved that the LSU Faculty Senate will conduct elections for Graduate Council representatives each spring semester to fill vacancies in their respective Graduate Council College or school member terms that expire each year. So, do I hear a motion to uh, put this into our business? Suresh, do I see a second? Yes, Belinda. So, now we're open for discussion. Before we do that, uh, I'll explain that I took the School of Coast and the Environment directly off of the Graduate School website listing of Graduate Council membership. And so we have corrected that because their official name now is College of Coast and the Environment. And we do have, as I said earlier, uh, administrative support for this change. And those four colleges are the ones whose members terms are expiring. They expire again the end of the academic year, which is in August. So their terms expire in August of 2019. And so we would hope to have the elections probably even before spring so that we could get this done. So that would be again next month. So with that, what discussion do you have? Yes. Um, can you say again, you said that the graduate school dean was supportive of this concept? Yes, I've talked with Dr. Richardson and received email correspondence, and the Faculty Senate Executive Committee did meet last Thursday with uh, Interim Dean Richardson and Associate Dean Wicks, and we didn't discuss this specifically, but in between times, they have expressed support for, yes, it's, it's probably time that we do this and, and move it into alignment with our other responsibilities of being responsible for developing <coughs> educational policy. In fact, I just got another confirmation this morning. So, anything else? Yes, Andrew. How big is the faculty council's membership proportion to size of the college? There are three colleges that have lots of graduate students, they each have two. And so we'd probably retain that system. And in the original, um, the original plan that was developed, let's say seven, maybe eight years ago before I became vice president, um, the plan was to maintain that so that and I don't, real, I don't remember the actual proportion there. But there would be three and possibly four colleges with sufficient graduate students that they would have two representatives. Every other college, regardless of numbers, would have one. This staggered election allows then a transition without abruptly changing the graduate council membership all of a sudden. And that appeared to be a fairly reasonable compromise between what we originally proposed that we start the elections immediately and now with this transition over a period of three, three to four years, then if all the members will eventually be elected by their college. Lily? No, no, okay. Yeah. Lily has brought up a really important point. Every faculty member, whether instructor, assistant, associate, full, adjunct, is a member of the faculty council. Yeah. We technically, you are the delegated body of the faculty council that makes decisions. 
That is different than the graduate council, which advises the dean. So we have a faculty council that is inactive because the faculty senate performs all the roles delegated to the faculty council, and there's a graduate council that's currently appointed. You're elected. They're appointed. Yes? Can I just make one comment on that? Yes. Sort of on the graduate council or something. I suppose on that one. Um, they, they, they really don't, they advise the people. They don't take actions themselves. At least when I was there. Not at all. Advising the people. How, however, how can I say this tactfully? Some of the graduate council do not understand that they should be representative of either the faculty and graduate faculty in their college or the graduate faculty at large. And as a result, then we don't have any continuity in actually how that operates. And this would provide very clear instruction that that graduate council member would represent their college graduate faculty in advising the dean. Now, they also advise the dean on things like courses and curricula, but our courses and curricula committee determines whether it's approved and in what form it is. Same as if they want to change their standards. If a college or school wants to change their standards, even the graduate school they come to the Admission Standards and Honors Committee, which again is a faculty senate committee. So that's how the shared governance really operates. They are advisory, and in some aspects, the thought is that the graduate faculty, which meets every semester, or is supposed to meet every semester, will actually then also be able to provide much more input than they have in the past couple of years. So that's the intent, and this is one of the first steps to do that. Since the Executive Vice President and Provost Haney has been able to join us, uh, I'll, if she's got any other comments, uh, well, we, we understand that this is going to be a change. Thank you. of this body because there are certain members of this body while the vast majority hold graduate faculty status there are some who are not members of the graduate faculty and so I want to be very thoughtful about ensuring that the graduate faculty at large also has a voice here so if in fact this resolution can be presented to the graduate faculty um, and also have their input on it before the I don't anticipate that there would be any um, concerns about it, but I feel like that that's a, it is a different body in terms of composition, so I want to be sure that that body governs itself and has the opportunity to say, yes, we actually want to be there too. So I want to be thoughtful about that. That's the only thing in reading through the, the resolution. I apologize. I have not read through that before today. Um, and I know they don't meet um, all that regularly, but we could certainly ask that body to come together to, to join. Um, I, I think that is. This I think that is a perfect point. Yes, that we're going to have representation then, obviously, <coughs> and it's intended that only the graduate faculty in each college would determine who their representative, who their council member would be. Um, I, it's not for public distribution, but one of the colleges is already developing a policy because they have one of their, their graduate council members who is uh, not going to be able to serve, so they've already proposed how they will replace that, and it's not exactly a total election, but it will eventually work out that way. So we've already got some mechanisms in place to do that. Any other discussions? If not, then we'll vote on whether to uh, 
accept the first reading and move it into our business item for next month. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, thank you very much. Next um, item of business is resolution 19-05. Uh, Dean Wildman was here the end of last semester, I believe, correct? It was last semester. Uh, yes, and explained what was going on with Elsevier, and so this resolution is to provide our support of that, uh, the libraries, and as a consequence, our faculty senate library committee to figure out how best that this is going to be accomplished. So it is sponsored by LSU Libraries, uh, Brooks Elwood, who couldn't be here today, Judith Shibu, who is our faculty senate uh, libraries committee chair and Paula Hira. I we're not really sure who wants to read that. Paul, would you like to read that? Well, we actually found someone. All right, Nan, are you ready to read? Sure. LSU AM Faculty Senate Resolution 19-05. LSU is El Sevier subscription package. Sponsored by LSU Libraries, Brooks Elwood, Judith Chabot, and Paul McCoy. Whereas the cost of academic journals has increased 521% between 1986 and 2015, threatening the scholarly communication system in every discipline, and whereas journal expenses at the LSU Libraries currently consume 48% of its total budget, up from just 24% 10 years ago, which has resulted in an unacceptable decrease in library support for books, databases, and other collections, staffing, and services. And whereas LSU's current five-year contract with the commercial publisher Elsevier expires at the end of 2019, at which point it will cost at least $2 million per year, and whereas new document delivery technologies have become available giving LSU alternatives to subscriptions that are fast, convenient, and free to users, and whereas limiting expenditures for the Sevier journals will free up funding that will allow the libraries to address long-standing collection efficiencies, and whereas similar initiatives are in progress this year at research institutions around the world. Therefore, be it resolved that the Faculty Senate of Louisiana State University supports the LSU Library's effort to reduce Elsevier expenditures, subscribe to the most important Elsevier journals, and replace canceled journal subscriptions with expedited document delivery services. I will preface that, yeah, and Dean Wilder and uh, Associate Dean Kuiper and Paul are here to answer questions, but before I open up the floor, uh, when I presented this to the Board of Supervisors, it fit very well because they had previously had a presentation from Finance and Administration, uh, Vice President Lazelle, on how we're doing more with less and continuing to do that. But if we're going to increase enrollment, either both graduate and undergraduate enrollment, our online education efforts, then that money has to come from somewhere. So uh, past chair Perry brought up the notion that we should have a strategic plan. So it was very appropriate then for me to say, yes, the faculty are willing to do their part, and the library is also involved. This is a joint faculty and administrative effort to, one, provide continuing access to the journals and serial subscriptions that we need at the same time, knowing that we can't possibly continue to keep expending those kinds of funds. So with that, that background, I'll open the floor for uh, any questions, comments, Dean Wilder. Uh, yes, Linda. Um, so I apologize, I missed last month's meeting, um, but I was here for the library presentation and brought this um, proposal up in a faculty meeting. 
And I heard from one of our faculty members who regularly uses ILL for journals because she studies gender and politics, and we have a very small collection of journals that deal with that. And she mentioned just two um, issues. One was there, whether, and I emailed the director of libraries, and there's no formal rule right now about how many ILL journal articles you can request. There appears to be an informal rule where she has to get special permission every time she goes over a number of downloads. Now, I'm assuming that that's going to change when we move to this. But the other big thing that she mentioned was that when you do ILL journal articles, um, they don't send you automatically the online appendices, which can be really important in figuring out exactly what was going on in the statistical analysis or how the data set was constructed, and that that's an issue that should be addressed if we're going this route, that that needs to be automatically included when journal articles are sent to faculty. <coughs> Molly, would you like to address that? Uh, sure. As to the first point, as to the number of uh, transactions, uh, <coughs> there in the, in the past there has been a rule of five that is the creation of commercial publishers and pertained in, in, in my uh, <coughs> field for many years. Um, uh, there, that the, there is no legal uh, uh, basis for the rule of five, and it's being discarded wholesale across the country um, and with strong uh, legal opinion behind this. So uh, a thing that we're talking about here is, is I, I'm going to go back and check to see um, this has been a uh, procedure change that we've made in the library within the last year, but I want to make sure that, that, that that's actually translated all the way through and that nobody's getting any, any of, the, of the old messages as, you, as it may, that, that may be what's happening here. Um, and then as to the, uh, the appendices issue, this has come up and, uh, uh, and uh, what I, I don't have a, a firm answer for you on this except that, that uh, we consider the appendices to be part and parcel of the of, of this literature, and, and we will get it for you in some way. How exactly that's going to play out, I don't, I can't, I can't actually give you an answer today. But, but um, uh, it's, it's just not acceptable to have anything less than the entirety of the content. Yes, in the back. Yes, um, I endorse this concept. Boy, I've been busy, um, and I. Elsevier especially has been difficult to drill work with in recent times. Things like open access and things It's less effective than it used to be with the open My question here, though, is simply the following. There's one thing in the resolution that is not defined very well, and that is um, how will we, we will subscribe to the most important journal. How will that be the, the, the way that we imagine doing this is to is to look at it, the last 12 months of use <coughs> at LSU among, among LSU faculty, uh, and then just doing a strict um, uh, descending order um, uh, 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 greatest use to less use, and stopping at at, the, at, the, at when the cost of the total package reaches one million dollars. So we're talking about um, about uh, trying to do our to to accommodate the highest use titles in the elsewhere package. So it's a numerical. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if that's going to account for the most important journal or not. You know, I think that word important is 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 uh, problematic. Uh, it seems to be evaluative in, in, in various ways, which is which is not helpful for us. Another thing that, that I'd like to say is that that. Um, with the process that we imagine working through with the Baptist Senate Library Committee, um, we would leave ourselves some room to negotiate as to as to what the uh, uh, the final package of subscribed elsewhere titles would be in such a way as to allow us to do, have some alternative to a strict mechanical ranking. I think that's right. I, I really want to stress though, I, I endorse this concept oh, whole term. Do you want to change the wording to the most used Elsevier journals? That is the most accurate. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Dan, second. No, you're first. Yes. 
Uh, in the front. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. So um, I know other universities have gone with this one million dollar cutoff. The University of California went with a complete cutoff, right? Yeah. And and so I'm just wondering if someone here is keeping track of how that's going. Oh, I can tell you, well, the University of California um, uh, process has been spectacularly successful. The rate of, of, of faculty approval for this program after the decision was made, is, is, it, was, it was high to begin with, but it's, but it's 90% now. Uh, another thing that's happened since, since I presented on this uh, is that the country of Norway has, has also uh, unilaterally uh, cut their, their elsewhere faculty. So we have Hungary, Sweden, Norway, Germany, uh, 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 California. There really is a groundswell in the, in, in the making here. Should we jump on board, or should we? <laughs> Craig, should we also? Or Craig and then Dan. Yes, OK, so um, that's, um, just uh, using a criterion that is based only on number of the number of downloads or something like that? That's right. Um, have, have other types of more complicated um, algorithms been considered, such as um, considering journals by department or by school, by college, but say, say by department, um, physics department, biology department, certain, for each one of those you would go down a bit separately, or even what if the most used journal is the most expensive one? For example, um, including uh, cost as one of the weight factors. Right. Yes, we certainly have considered all sorts of different um, ways of, of parsing this. Uh, the, the using a strict departmental um, approach doesn't feel like like it has legs at all. Insofar as there's so much interdisciplinary use, but the, these journals do not do not match the LSU organization chart, so to speak, as as regards our departmental breakdowns. Um, uh, there, so, so there are other kinds of uh, approaches that we can take, but the, uh, but the actual differences between them are, are relatively small, and this, this approach has the benefit of simplicity in such a way that we can communicate and, and, and maintain it uh, uh, as best we can. On the other hand, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to close out um, uh, uh, any other alternative um, that the folks may, may have by way of uh, su suggesting a different way of cutting this. That, that piece of it is secondary to, to, to the main project. Yes, Dan. Right, oh yeah, well, revisit it. I mean, you, you know, the idea that no, no decision that we make here is final. I mean, we're talking about annual subscriptions yep. now in such a way that we can already be making, making uh, uh, changes to this. Well, I was going to ask whether uh, if the, the list of those journals, could, could the resolution include the list of a typical of top 100 journals so we could see that all of our favorite ones are on there? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why can't the list be in there in small print? It's too much. Well, then top 100 journals? 160. Well, it may not be 100. I mean, depending because the serial costs are changed every year. So by the time we actually enter into a Elsevier contract, then costs may change. So it may be 95 or it may be 107. I mean... But it would just be a sample list. Yes. My, my recommendation... Uh, Jerry, go ahead with your comment and then I'll make one. I guess my question was just brought up by this point. Is it, based off what you said, California has completely eliminated this subscription. And so we're looking at cutting the subscription in half and display and having, I don't know, bickering over who gets what kind of thing whenever it's that solution that has brought the most favorable supporters. I guess I'm just confused as far as as far as the reconciliation of why we're why we're at subscription whenever based off of this information. Well, I wouldn't want to speak for Dean Wilder of the Library Committee, but my sense is that this is an intermediate step, so we still maintain a relationship with Elsevier that's not totally antagonistic, and yet we also are able to cut our costs. I would suggest that we go back to 
years and three years along with the current year. We do have as, plenty of data. And, and to see how those averages are, my point for doing that is that we've hired enough new faculty in specified areas in the last two years, and one would think that they are much more accustomed to accessing online as a general practice rather than a print copy that some of us are accustomed to, and that might change things. The other I would ask is that there be some dollar amount for exceptions <coughs> a faculty member could actually make or a department could actually make the case for, yes, this is an important journal, even though it might be number 450 on our list of accesses. That, those are the two things I would, I would recommend. Yes, Doran and then uh, I know one of the points of contention with reading the University of California talk their subscription was the, they were trying to incorporate into their $10 million package the open access for all the researchers from the University of California. In other words, I think they were willing to pay $10 million as long as all the papers published with the authors from the University of California were automatically open access. Uh, and that's if you didn't want that, and that's going to have a problem. Uh, in this package that we have, uh, are there provisions, or are we going to negotiate, are there going to be provisions for automatic open access or reduce cost for open access? Uh, yeah, I can, you know, the, the open access portion of the UC system uh, proposal was the thing that absolutely killed the Dell Severe Tide. So, uh, the idea that uh, that all U of C system authored articles uh, be be open be published open access, Elsevier was categorically against that, and, and it scuttled the deal altogether. Uh, we are uh, completely committed in libraries <coughs> to helping to nurture, foster an institution-wide uh, 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 awareness campaign relative to open access. But this is a, this feels downstream from the the resolution that we're talking. About. Here we have a, a fire to put out. We have a time, a timeline, um, uh, a deadline to to contend with in the, in the, uh, 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 the contract that we're, that we're dealing with, and so we're expecting that uh, that will follow up, uh, provide a more successful um, uh, with uh, with a program really relative to raising awareness as to open access as a as a, as a publishing option. Um, I have a. Um, sometimes when I'm at home and I'm trying to look up articles and I can't access them and they have this well, like Athens open access thing that we're not a member of, is that something we would be considering becoming a member of if we do this? I think it's amazing that you know what open Athens, Athens is. So we, have a, we have a way of, of doing, um, uh, uh, get, getting access, uh, to, uh, authorized access to electronic content through uh, a, a, a technology called Easy Proxy now, and that's been the industry standard everywhere. Open Athens is, is brand new, and uh, and we are considering this. I mean, to say right these weeks, uh, along with the uh, statewide consortium in, in Louisiana. So as to, I, I do not know that that uh, Open Athens would actually have any day-to-day uh, uh, -day impact on faculty. I'm looking to to. It has so lots of advantages for 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 the library because managing those those permissions is extremely labor intensive now. And Open Athens would make that lots easier. But uh, uh, yeah, it just says put in your credentials from your university. But our university is not on the list to choose from. <coughs> That's I right. I had the same thing yes. this weekend. There are very few universities who are on that list, right? Oh. Uh, it's pretty, oh. This is a pretty new. There was that and a, and a couple other choices for similar type online issues. Yeah. Access. Right. Stuart next. Um, I support this resolution. At least it, it may need some tinkering, but generally it's a good resolution. Um, I use the documentary delivery service from the library a lot, and it's really excellent. So much better than it used to be. Um, I've been, in, uh, I've been in academia for more than 30 years, and for all my time here, I've listened to complaints about Elsevier and how they have gouged libraries. 
this is a, there's a long history here. And as far as I'm concerned, any day that you can screw Elsevier, <laughs> that's a damn good day.
am I addressing yeah. Yeah. some of the trends that are occurring are that more and more professional societies that were publishing their own journal now those costs have become such that Springer and Oxford and Elsevier are able to reduce the cost for an association even if the members don't totally agree with that. The other thing is some of the, what I would say, smaller publishers are now starting to offer we will host your online and we'll do all the editing and all the proofing and the uh, coding that's required for an online journal and there's just a lot more options than there used to be. And so I think the landscape will change very quickly over the next two or three years, and it's going to be hard for us to keep up. That's right. I do one last quick point, and to, to Dr. Irvine's made the point about the document delivery service that we have in place right now. Anything that we've done since we've talked last is to go and look at our turnaround time by unit, by college of science, and, and, and by department. And we have the numbers here, and what we can tell you is, is that is that in is that in, in, in the overview, over seventy percent of the uh, of the uh, uh, interlibrary loan transactions that we currently get are, are filled within 24 hours. So really what we're talking about here, the, the inconvenience factor is only instantaneous for something that we used to own versus versus 24 hours from faster um, uh, uh, access to those, to those articles. It's not about not getting access, it's, it's, it's uh, a little bit of a delay. Yes. Can you explain no, how no, no, no. actually works legally? How it works like legally? Uh, because I mean, there do, are there contracts with other universities who have who subscribe to those journals and there's there costs involved. And I mean, if if we're getting uh, um, Elsevier um, articles from another source, obviously they're going to follow up on this and. Um, eventually going to increase the cost somewhere else or try to prevent um, ILL or how, how does this work? I'm not really sure. Well, because how, how can you actually, I mean, what's the advantage of having a subscription? Obviously, there's some advantages because you can actually browse and you can, you can look at the paper, which is, which is, you know. Well, you're going to be able to continue to browse, right? And you'll still be able to search Science Direct, for example, for elsewhere titles and, and uh, have, have full access to seeing the titles. Is the, the titles, is the, yes. I mean, but the part of Very different thing. Right. So, so the, the ability of, of libraries to do interlibrary loan is sort of built into the U.S. Code, Section 108, uh, which sort of makes library, like libraries possible to purchase things and, and lend them out. I see. Um, and so, uh, as to, uh, that's just sort of the, the, the background, the, as to electronic resources, which are generally uh, uh, almost entirely governed by licenses, there we're talking about negotiating terms of use that allow for interlibrary loan. And so, so uh, but, um, because this is such a, a strong cultural value on, the, on part of anyone, academia all over the place, um, uh, we, we, we take care to negotiate terms to allow for interlibrary loan between, between libraries. So uh, we can be sure, for example, that uh, the Elsevier content that we would fail to stop subscribing to, yeah. it, it's going to be continue to be available in, in vast numbers of libraries all over the world. Right. And then how does Elsevier <coughs> respond to this? That's going to be a that's going to be a fun to watch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> how how have things have been responding all this time? They've been responding to their 39 percent profit margin, which I can't stop talking about. That's what they had in their last in their last uh, uh, their uh, their uh, uh, publicly traded company 39 percent profit margin. El Elsevier is one company where they've had a liaison, a staff liaison with every journal. Now those staff are some leaving and they're not able to replace those slots. So there are some journals now that technically are relying on the editors to be the liaison with the company. And so actually there's not really much oversight except they belong to Elsevier as the journal. So, so Elsevier again, itself, that landscape is changing. Elsevier itself is then not able to meddle in the way we do the interlibrary loan. Is that, is that right? That's right. And otherwise, they prohibit it. Um, Dr. Dildell. Okay, I had three things. One was uh, on that first, whereas uh, I suggest you clarify it with maybe one word somewhere. 
uh, it's first the cost of academic journals being increasing by some percent. Uh, it's not clear whether that means the worldwide cost or the nationwide cost or the statewide cost or the other. Is there not a citation to that? I it think does. It I haven't read that citation. Okay, so it's, it's, it, that's data from the Association of Research Libraries, which is the largest um, North American, Canadian, and U.S. research institution. So about 120 of them. So that's where that, that's where that number comes from. But, but that number applies. Everybody across the world is paying the same, same amount. So, uh, by extension. Okay, and uh, second, the next one was uh, UC, the, the University of California, granted that 90% of the faculty are, are pleased. Do, do you know how they are actually getting their articles? They, I assume they still need to see some articles from L7 here. Well, they're doing it with, 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 with um, document delivery uh, services that, that, that are very similar to what we're proposing here. But keeping in mind that uh, the University of California decision happened two weeks ago. I mean, what was it? Three, right? Does anybody have a better? February 28th, I saw it in the news. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so it's very, very recent. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm from the math department, and I understand from your colleague, Aaron Lurcher, that uh, all math journals from Elsevier will be canceled. And uh, one of my math colleagues was complaining about that, and he uh, he suggested that if we need to find another $1 million, we could uh, trim somewhere at the upper administration. <laughs> uh, we've got, it seems, I haven't really been following it in the last few years, but uh, it seemed to him like we've been hiring more and more expensive uh, administrators. And they be that as it may, uh, what, we're, what, what, what academics do by way of, of creating research giving it away to a commercial publisher and then buying it back in exorbitant price. That's the problem. This is not a faculty versus administrative problem. It's, that's part of what I hope to get across with, with, with the uh, national and international scope of this, is that this is something that 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 is a plague on academia. It's a, all we have to do is, is to take control of that last little chunk of our scholarly communication process, and, and, and suddenly we have the ability to uh, to right size, for example, our collection support for the LSU community, which is a thing that we have never had the capacity to do before. <coughs> the only way you get a new, new, new journal subscription and over the past 30 years at this institution is canceling something of equal or greater value. That does nothing to help LSU keep keep pace with it, the programmatic growth and, and, and uh, research agenda of the institution. I guess we could fire two or three math professors and come up with that million for <laughs> 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 <laughs>
just you know, our first step is to is to get permission to do this. Right. And, and once we do, then we have the next um, uh, lovely problem to deal with, which is which is to figure out how to how to what to do with the money that we freed up. Okay. It's it's entirely possible that um, that I don't know, just pick half of it could go right back into journal subscriptions, but but journal subscriptions in in, in other areas, or it could be databases, um, which are also an ongoing cost. We have massive need across the university for databases that we don't currently subscribe to. So, you know, it could be that that actually doesn't that it doesn't change the, the percent those percentage percentages much at all. But what we will get is a better match of our collection to the research agenda at the university. Any other items? What I would propose is that we change the words to the most important, change that to specific, so that then we leave open the actual process of determining which journals, some may not be the most important, but they're valuable to a specific individual or a specific purpose. Is that a wording change that is acceptable? With that, any last comments? We'll make that change then for the second reading. Uh, but before we can have a second reading, we have to pass it into a first reading. So do we have a motion on the floor to entertain this? Yes. Event, second. Do I see it? Stewart, second. Any other discussion? All in favor then say aye. 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 All opposed no. Any abstentions? All right, and it will go into second reading uh, at our April meeting. The last resolution uh, will have Dr. Sylvester read, and I want to make a few comments before she actually does while she's getting ready. When I presented this to the board, <coughs> Uh, Dr. Alexander immediately said, yes, we have to do something. He and I have had several conversations. We've already talked numerous times that this is a policy because we have a, a no tobacco uh, and technically no vaping uh, policy on campus. The question has always been, how do we enforce that? So hopefully this resolution will help us to move some of our programs forward and figure out exactly how are we going to uh, increase the wellness aspects of our students and faculty and staff who still do these products, knowing that one, there's a health risk, two, there's a safety risk in some of the vaping materials, and three, it's against our policy. So with that, Judith. Thank you. Happy National Kick Butts Day, everybody. <laughs> this resolution because this is the day um, so let me say that um, second of all I also want to inform you that today I believe if it, if it went forward as the students plan there's also a similar not the exact same thing but a similar resolution going before student government and I also have reached out to the staff Senate and hopefully they will also join in uh, on the efforts to do this um, so, with that, uh, LSU A&M Faculty Senate Resolution 19-6, support for the LSU 100% Tobacco Policy and Anti-Vaping Education Program, sponsored by me, but I also want to add that, um, kind of, we got this a little bit after these had been printed, but I'm also getting support from um, the, um, that school, and specifically Alexandra Knoll, and Arthur Penn, who have research programs going on right now. Um, and then um, Dean um, Bates, 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 Bates sorry. Um, also has, is very supportive of this, and he's involved with the um, um, ongoing strategic plan, the health and wellness part of that. So, um, and then in addition to that, Michael Russo, who's been involved with me with this for years, uh, also has lent his support, and Amy Copeland, um, who has the uh, lab in psychology that looks at the psychology of addiction, 
She's also been doing some research in this area, published in this area, and she's also um, um, happy to cooperate with that. And I also say, if any of you are interested, please let me know, and all I do is sponsors um, for the second reading, provided we get that far. Okay, so, um, whereas LSU was required by Act 211 to establish its tobacco policy on campus by August 1st, 2014, Whereas the policy is 100% tobacco free, including combustibles, vaping devices, <coughs> e-cigarettes, and smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco. Um, whereas LSU has failed to enforce the policy and ignored all warnings that vaping, especially the use of Juul, is a trend on campus. Whereas LSU further ignored that the lithium batteries in vaping devices can explode, causing serious injury or death from the flames and shrapnel expelled during the explosion and failed to ban e-cigarettes from campus as it had hoverboards with similar batteries. Whereas a campus-wide stratified random sample survey, referred to in this resolution as the survey, was conducted during the fall 2018 semester by myself um, through my Smoking Words program with 1,242 responses collected from undergraduate students, graduate and professional students, administrators, faculty and staff, indicated that the percentage of students who are aware of LSU's 100% tobacco-free policy has fallen from 93% in 2015 to 79% last fall in 2018. Whereas the percentage of students using combustibles on campuses remained about 12%, while the percentage using vaping devices on campus has increased from 4% in 2015 to 27% in 2018. Whereas students reporting seeing vaping devices used on campus has increased from 63% in 2015 to 93% in 2018. Whereas 77% of the students who vape prefer Juul, a product that contains about 5% nicotine, which is roughly as much nicotine as in a pack of cigarettes, according to the company. Whereas vaping devices are essentially nicotine delivery systems, and nicotine is a highly addictive sus substance, Whereas of the 190 students surveyed who used tobacco <coughs> products, 42% said their tobacco use had increased since entering LSU, 35% said it had remained the same, and 23% uh, said use had decreased. Whereas 23% of the students reporting having asthma, allergies, or other breathing problems, uh, and 45% of students reported avoiding areas of campus to prevent exposure to secondhand smoke or vape. Whereas both the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration have declared vaping to be in of epidemic proportions in middle and junior high schools and high schools, but has not addressed the problem on camp college campuses. Whereas 99% of tobacco users start before age 26, and every day, more than 1,200 people in this country die due to smoking. Whereas FDA-sponsored research indicates that nicotine has negative effects on the brains of teenagers and adolescents, and that vapor from e-cigarettes contains chemicals that can be detrimental to both the user and secondhand to non-smokers and non-vapers. Um, whereas the FDA has taken steps to prohibit tobacco companies from marketing Juul and other vaping products, to adolescents and young adults, including candy-like flavors, whereas the Louisiana legislature, legislature will soon consider a law raising the tobacco purchasing age to 21, whereas LSU has a responsibility to educate its students about the dangers of all types of tobacco use and to enforce its 100% tobacco-free policy for health and safety reasons. Whereas an earlier survey that I conducted with college and universities with established tobacco policies indicated that while student support is useful, public support from top administrators is critical to the success of the policy. Therefore, let it be resolved that LSU take the following steps immediately. One, establish a permanent community committee, committee including representatives from student health services, student life, the athletic department, student government, campus sustainability, LSU public affairs and strategic communication, and any other interested group or organization that will promote LSU's tobacco <coughs> policy to students, faculty, staff, and campus visitors. The committee will track ten, tre, um, trends in tobacco use, especially among students, to determine the best ways to promote and enforce the policy, 
and to maintain adequate funding for educational initiatives and possible tobacco cessation programs for student, faculty, and staff. Three, the committee will further provide educational information regarding vaping and smoking research, FDA regulation of tobacco products, changes in Louisiana tobacco laws, up-to-date health information, and to create counter-messages to tobacco company promotions. Such information should be delivered through signage, posters, handout materials, social media messages, and sponsorship of events such as the National Great American Smokeout in November and Kick Butts Day in March, or campus events that are promoted as tobacco-free. Establishing a peer-to-peer -to -peer tobacco education program is recommended. Four, establish and promote a hotline on campus so that those with questions about the policy who are seeking cessation information or who are sensitive to secondhand smoke and vapor, are pregnant, or have other health concerns, can report infractions of the policy, such as vaping in classrooms and congregation of smokers and vapors in spaces that pose a health risk to employees and students. Tobacco-related trash accumulation also should be reported. Uh, request that faculty include a notice in their syllabi that vaping in classrooms is prohibited by the LSU 100% tobacco-free policy. Requires strong public administrative support for LSU's 100% tobacco free policy that is maintained from year to year so that all incoming students and new faculty and staff are aware of the policy and any penalties attached to it, and so that visitors to campus are made aware that LSU is 100% tobacco free. And I apologize for the length of that, but you should have seen the first draft. Um, and then I have just three little quick uh, videos that I would like for you to see that are coming from the Surgeon General of the United States, which is another group that's also involved with this. I provided you also with a, a quite a bit of a supporting documentation, which I've also cut down. Um, but I did want to include that, you know, because a question that's often asked about these are, what are other universities doing? The University of Kentucky has been my role model for quite a while, and they also are reporting that they're having to deal with this as well. And so I included an editorial that they wrote, and they also gave me the links to these. There's a lot of information on YouTube um, that you can look up if you have questions about this. Okay, did I cover everything? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the end of your video. That's the end of my video. Right. Yeah, yeah, so um, I, I commend you on your kick-ass day, um, always for people to speak up about what you believe in. Um, but I, I wonder if people are aware that tobacco is one type of a strain of drug. People smoke a lot more than just tobacco. And tobacco is the big, big, big bad wolf in this, which I agree. But a lot of our students don't smoke tobacco at all. They smoke cannabis, they smoke other strains of um, different things. So actually in Williams Hall, and I'm not the one that would be the first to police this kind of thing, but is there a reason why tobacco is the only thing? Yes, because that's what our policy is. Our but, policy does not mention any of the others. But so, so the reason that I asked for a committee to be formed it's, it's good, is so we can look at some of these other issues as okay, well. Okay, so it's kind of like that it's a gateway to look at other things? It's, okay. yes. And actually, especially e-cigarettes are a gateway to a lot of addiction. Not so just it's, tobacco. It's not just tobacco use with vaping. People are vaping lots Right, of but again, our policy defines it as okay, so a tobacco product. Keep it tobacco so 
the limit is, is it? Yes. Okay. But it's not that we're naive about no. other other things. No. In fact, I had a student this morning tell me about something else, and I was like, okay, that would be something we could deal with. Later. Okay. So we're starting just with this, but we're not. But yeah. it's not that because really what happened was we did not, even though we put at my insistence and then some other things that came along e-cigarettes in the policy. When we did this policy in 2014, e-cigarettes were just coming on the market. Oh, and no. and um, Juul has only been on the market for two years. No. And we're already seeing 70% of our students using that product. So I think Juul, though, by the time we submit this, it may be obsolete with the other delivery systems. So Juul is just one of many, many, many. Yeah, but it's the one that that everybody's worrying about. But it's it's an American company as well. Okay, I, I'm with it. you. I just was wondering why we, we're not talking about other kinds of smoking because that's way more prevalent among our students than tobacco. Well, which is, well, it's FDA does regulate this. Surgeon General does have no regulatory power. FDA actually is considering under Scott uh, Gottlieb before he leaves as commissioner and actually banning all vaping devices for anybody under right. 21. Right. And also keep in mind that the things you're talking about are still illegal, right? There are laws that say this is illegal, Depends. whereas the tobacco right. is right. unfortunately not. Cannabis isn't always illegal. Yes. Well, cannabis in the state, it still is until right. our, we get our medicinal. It's limited to medicinal. Right, right. Other comments or discussion? Yes, Paul. Just a suggestion, but perhaps the word free should be met, should be added in the title. So that oh. not a suggestion that we all start smoking. Yeah, it should be. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well. Any other discussion? Yes. We used to have stickers on the front of the, on the blackboards in front of the room with electrons that said, no eating, drinking, or smoking. Yeah. What about reviving that? I, I would love, I actually think we do need to do the end, because keep in mind that one thing, and, and you all need to be paying attention to what's going on in your classrooms, because they're using these things in your classrooms. And that's why my school, you know, voluntarily, without my begging them, so let's put it in our syllabus that we will not have any use of this in our classrooms. But it's still going to be up to you then to deal with it, right? So doesn't it create this big cloud of seed or something? No, Jewel does not, which is why it's so popular. You, if you walk past the quad, you will see the few people that are still using the bigger ones, and you'll see the clouds. But with Jewel, they can have it in their pocket, in their purse, which is actually kind of scary to me because of the battery yeah. thing. Um, but they can do that and they can bring them into your classroom and they can, one student again this morning just said to me, you know, I, I, there's somebody in my row who every single day comes in and smokes through the whole class. So it doesn't create a visible cloud of anything, no. but it's still You have to be pretty close to it and if they still are hand. using the, if they still can get the flavors, the students can smell that. They tell me they smell Blackberry and how so, so bad that is. <laughs> it creates an invisible cloud of nicotine part? Jewel does. does yep. And they plug them into their it looks like a USB. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it looks it looks like a flash drive. Yeah. And that's why parents aren't catching it and why schools aren't catching it in middle school. I mean in an all perfect world, I would love for us to have access to our lab school and develop some educational materials that could be then filtered down to our middle schools and our high schools, because if we can stop it there, it's going to help us, right? That's my goal, my long term. But first, first, first things first. <laughs> yes? My own, I'm, I'm all for this. Um, my only concern is just that with having a policy in the syllabi specifically, remember last time this came up, a couple months ago, it was established that there's really no punitive actions that can be taken. So adding a line in the syllabus that when we know that there's no campus-wide punitive actions that, that can be taken, that just makes me a little nervous putting something in there where someone is continuously vaping in the classroom, 
if there's nothing in place that I can really implement. Well, in, no, no. in reality, there actually are some penalties are, okay. in our, our policy. It's just that it's up to you to turn them in. Okay. Once they get turned in, then it becomes part of student, yeah. uh, the judiciary policy, dean of students, that kind of stuff. And I'm actually hoping we can get some statistics about what they have done. Within, within reason, every instructor is in charge of their classroom at the time instruction is given. So if you have in your syllabus that if we find you vaping, using tobacco, <clears throat> smokeless, or, or otherwise, you'll be asked to leave, and they don't, call campus police. Okay. I mean, you're in charge of the environmental control of your classroom. And I know last time we talked about it, we were talking about the outdoor area. That yes. There wasn't much that could be done about that, but the, that'll work for that. Uh, as another comment, Chief Thompson is concerned about this. I've already mentioned that Dr. Alexander is concerned about this. Every level is concerned. It's, it's how are we going to enforce the policy because, again, how do you, how do you legislate against a habit or a behavior? Yeah, and right. that's really right. difficult, addiction, which is especially, what it is. especially now with the jewel. Yeah, we need to say what it is. Yes. I think there is something that we all can do, and I have done it myself. If I see somebody smoking on campus, I approach the person and I tell them, "This is a smoke-free campus. Please extinguish that immediately." And I threaten to call out the police. Maybe we should educate the faculty and staff about. That's, that's what I would really like to see happen. And, but I will tell you, as a veteran of this, they can be pretty nasty to you. And I personally don't get paid enough to deal with some of the abuse I've, I've actually suffered at the hands of some of But it's, again, it's harder with Jewel, right? It's, it's still easy for me to know when there's a smoker near me, because I, I react very quickly from a fairly long distance. But Jewel, you know. You can come sit in my office and watch the streams of students come out of Tarot Hall. And every time that they're doing this, it, they're doing it. Paul? I was under the impression, though, just to, to uh, respond to this uh, last comment, that uh, there wasn't anything the police could do. Um, is there something that they can do? OK. Um, here's the deal with that, OK? There is really nothing that says they can't. <laughs> But the interpretation from the campus police, the previous chief especially, was that Act 211 does not specifically say, do something. There is nothing that would prohibit us on campus, and I always hate to you know, start tinkering with a policy because sometimes you lose stuff you don't want to lose um, out of a policy. But there is nothing that would preclude us as a university to say, we need some teeth in this. And students have told me the only way they would quit it was if they were fined. I personally wouldn't mind seeing some fines, but I also would like to see some campus cleanup where they have to go pick up the cigarette butts and the tobacco packages, sustainability, um, and um, you know, do some community service if they're habitually doing this. Now, nobody's going to... You know, I, honestly, we were really close to having this under control. And if it had not been for Jewel and the fact there was no regulation on e-cigarettes and that students figured this out very quickly and get addicted to it very quickly, um, then, you know, and all of a sudden, and the reason I'm here today is because I just, when I saw the results last fall, which I knew that I had the statistics for it, I was just horrified. <laughs> Uh, and knowing that the university had, had missed several opportunities to deal with it along the way and chose not to. I was just curious that if we did have a policy or, or, or you know, a campaign where we said to people, if you see something, report something, and they actually did it to the police, what would be the follow-up? And it seems to me that there really, really wouldn't be any. There wouldn't, uh, probably. I mean, there'd have to be more than that. And, and that's why I asked for a hotline because um, just calling the police, and honestly, I mean, it, this is not the only problem we have on this campus. If you've been reading in the news, police are pretty busy. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think we have to come to some agreement about who's gonna enforce this. And we really, really tried to do it peer-to-peer. -peer. 
and for a number of reasons that has been suspended or stopped or just didn't work and we didn't deal with it once it just didn't work. Um, and I used to do a lot of the signage and things on campus, but I don't have the money to do that anymore, which is why I want this coalition to put some money into it to develop the, the, the uh, things. I've got students who just love to do this kind of stuff. They're PR and advertising and they know how to do it. They know how to do social media. But it takes time and money and consistency, and unfortunately, the students that are supporting us right now will be graduating. So. And I was just going to say, I would, I would love to be able to call the police and say, this is happening. It's just that at this point, that's not really going to get it. Yeah, and I worry about women who are pregnant who deal with this. I get calls from people. Um, and I, in front of my building, there's a family that's been out there several days in a row, and they're all like little kids, and they're sitting there, we call it. Yeah. yeah, in the classroom setting, I believe the instructor should have the right to confiscate all of this e-cigarettes. I don't know how much they cost, but maybe uh, if they are confiscated, uh, students might maybe struggle in terms of buying a new one. I don't know how much they cost, but... Um, that would not be a deterrent, and I think you risk actually some physical contact with yeah. them they do not part with their stuff easily, and I don't know how to legally, I mean, we have to have some sort of legal backup on that, I would think. I'm not going to encourage you to do that, but I will say turn them in. <laughs> you, you, have, you have their IDs. The problem on campus is you have to ask them for their IDs, and if they don't choose to give them to you, we have no mechanism for dealing with that. It will be a similar situation if you approach them and ask them for their ID. Again, you know, have physical not if they're in your class. You should know who they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah my concern has been addressed. Anything else? So I do have a question. So um, we all know smoke detectors, right? Now, it's certainly been my observation that it's gone from smoking in the boys' room to vaping in the girls' room. Mm -hmm. Quite, yeah. Uh, literally. But how is this detected? Like, are, you know, because they, they do, they go into the restroom and they smoke, but there's no detection mechanism that I know. So is there one? I don't know of any either. I have, in the past, asked them if they could um, turn <coughs> campus cameras. We couldn't do it in a restroom, but turn them into the, you know, monitor the areas where we know we have issues. And I was basically told that they couldn't do that. Well, so. I'm, I'm actually asking, we have smoke detectors, or is there yeah, any no. such thing for these other... Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. But, again, we're evolving, so maybe we'll get to that point. Maybe we need to be getting to that point. Anything else? Then I'll ask for a motion that we accept. Uh, one question. Yes. Okay, is there any way that a student um, can come back and possibly sue the university? And, and say that, that the university is creating a hostile environment because they are an addict, right? And we are not providing them any type of support to break their addiction? I'd say let them try. That's what I'd say. <coughs> Should, do we um, consider, uh, my, my area was nursing homes, and this came up all the time. So it's very different because people live there. People don't live there. I understand it's a university. I understand also students kind of explore and make all kinds of stupid mistakes. I don't want them to die from <clears throat> cancer either. Do we have a designated smoking area for? No, we do not. And we specifically do not for a number of reasons. This comes up frequently. But and first of all, on this campus, there is no place for one that doesn't cross, that does, isn't still dangerous for okay. people who are walking around. The other thing is that if you created an area, you would have to, just like the buses, have the little pavilion with the tile roofs, $5,000 a piece. I know, it's very complicated. So, no, and, but we were advised very strongly from other universities that had tried to do that, not to, because they said it just weakens your whole ability to enforce what you do. So I think the big thing is at the onset, letting people know that it is, as we do a smoke-free campus, making sure the community knows that it's, um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, and it's much worse than it should be. <laughs>
I just have one final question. I think this was brought up the last time we talked about this. Um, so does the policy get suspended on game day Saturday? Or That's a good question. <laughs> That's why I asked for the athletic department to be part of that committee. Sure. Because the answer is no, but the answer is nobody pays attention. And what really upsets me, too, is that all the other SEC schools have similar policies. Uh, and maybe it's not enforced there either, but that to me, I've always said the SEC ought to be involved with this. Of course, not everybody would play her from the SEC. But the, the athletic department, in my humble opinion, could do a lot more than they do. And we do have often police lined up out here. But you know what? I see the police smoking. Yeah, and they and they do give them some business, right? But we need to get to that point with this, I think, before it's really gonna go anywhere. But a good education program is a good place to start because right now, did you did you all even know it was Kate Butt's day? No. I rest my case. So I'll entertain a motion to accept this as a resolution. Let's see. Levant, second. Okay, honor. Any other discussion? All in favor of accepting this as the first reading, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Any abstentions? Okay, we have one abstention. Please note that, Joan. <coughs> Anything else that we need to discuss today? <coughs> well, thank you very much. Don't forget, we will start college lessons at the beginning of the month. So if you're in a college that doesn't have a policy committee, then the retiring center will actually be helping conduct the election. We're going to do the college with the policy committee, and then I'll be in contact with them. So I have a motion to adjourn. Please be clear. All in favor of the Aye. Have a good weekend.